Putin has shown time and again that he's all bark and no bite. Ukraine has invaded Russian territory. Red lines have been crossed, and what has Putin done? Absolutely nothing. He threatened nuclear war if Ukraine attacked Russia, yet Ukraine is already in Kursk, and no nukes have been launched. He warned that deploying F-16s over Ukraine would bring devastating consequences. But guess what? Those jets are flying, and Putin's threats remain empty. Even now, as he draws yet another red line over long-range missiles being used inside Russia, we all know how this will play out. Ukraine will cross it, and Putin will do what he does best. Nothing. Russia has become the only nuclear-armed country in history to be invaded, and yet all we've seen from Putin are more hollow threats and empty promises. Just how far can Ukraine keep pushing the supposed red lines that NATO and Russia have created before President Vladimir Putin decides that enough is enough? Before we answer that question, there's another we need to answer. Just what is a red line exactly? In simple terms, a red line in the context of the Ukraine war is any action taken by Ukraine or its allies that could provoke Russia into a hostile response. The key word here is escalation, as it's believed that the crossing of any red line could escalate the Ukraine conflict, bringing the world closer to a war that could engulf all of Europe and beyond. And Putin has made it very clear since the beginning of his special military operation that Russia has a lot of these red lines. Speaking in a video for the UK's Telegraph news outlet, Dominic Nichols points out that Putin outlined several scenarios that he claimed would cause an escalation at the start of the Ukraine war. These scenarios included accepting Ukraine as a member of NATO, which would mean any attack on the country would trigger Article 5 and force the involvement of every other NATO member. He also threatened retaliation if NATO stationed any Western troops in Ukraine, as well as the possibility of a nuclear response if Ukraine's allies provided it with long-range ballistic missiles while allowing them to use those missiles inside Russia. Two out of those three early red lines haven't been crossed yet. Ukraine isn't a NATO member and likely won't become one before the war ends, and NATO troops aren't on the ground in Ukraine. As for the long-range missiles, Ukraine has several, but it's not been allowed to use them in Russia. Yet. But these initial three red lines are far from the only ones that Putin has attempted to put in place. Nichols said that the Russian leader sent a diplomatic note to Washington back in April 2022, warning of unpredictable consequences if Western countries continued to provide military aid to Ukraine. That's a red line that's been unequivocally crossed. The Kiel Institute says that the US and Europe have already combined to deliver over $114.5 billion in military aid to Ukraine, with tens of billions more in the pipeline. So, we see that Putin's red lines aren't necessarily set in stone. Still, they worked, at least during the early stages of the war. These red lines existed to create fear in the rest of the world that Putin would respond heavy-handedly if they were crossed, with the implication always being that nuclear weapons would be on the table. And in fairness, Russia wasn't the only one to establish red lines, NATO did the same. So scared was it of a Russian escalation. It's remained steadfast in not sending troops into Ukraine, and it hasn't accepted the beleaguered nation as one of its members. However, it's also hit back at Putin with red lines of its own. According to Babel, NATO has established a pair of red lines that could lead to it, rather than Russia, to escalate the conflict. The first is the involvement of any third party, directly or otherwise, in the war. Belarus, which is friendly to Russia, was used as a launching pad for the initial invasion of Ukraine, is a good example. NATO is now saying that any involvement from a third party in this way would intensify NATO's support of Ukraine. Does that mean NATO boots on the ground in Kyiv? The report doesn't say, although as we've seen so often with Putin's red lines, the implication is there. As for NATO's second red line, it appears to be any military provocation against the Baltic nations of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, or against Poland or Moldova. Russia threatened Moldova with a military scenario to resolve the Transnistria issue back in February 2024. The red line of Russian aggression against four of those nations shouldn't come as a surprise. The Baltic states and Poland are NATO members, so any assault on them would trigger the previously mentioned Article 5. But by drawing Moldova into its red lines, NATO is turning Putin's threats back on him. He may accuse NATO of being expansionist, but any evidence that he's attempting the same will result in a response. Of course, Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a clear sign of his desire to expand. But the point of all this is that these red lines have been used by both Russia and NATO as a means to threaten each other. Both sides have claimed that crossing those lines would have consequences, with each trying to exert its influence over Europe. There's a strong case to be made that Ukraine has been caught in the middle of these opposing red lines. The existence of these red lines has left it in a situation Nichols calls golden handcuffs. Yes, Ukraine is receiving billions in military aid from allies that do not want Putin to extend his power base, but it's so often been restricted in how it can use this aid to fight against Russia, such as being made to wait until 2024 by some of its allies for permission to use the weapons they're supplying inside Russia itself 
That's another red line crossed, by the way. So what has Ukraine been doing about this golden handcuff situation? It's pushing back, specifically by crossing several of the red lines that Russia had established. The most obvious example is the Kursk invasion, launched by Ukraine on August 6, 2024. That invasion saw several hundred Ukrainian troops, followed by several thousand, break through the Russian border checkpoints to take a surprisingly large amount of territory. As of late September 2024, it's believed that Ukraine holds 93 villages and similar settlements in Russia, amounting to about 463 square miles of the country. For context, that's more than Russia has managed to take in Ukraine's Donetsk region during 2024, and this invasion should never have happened, considering that any attack on Russian territory would be seen by Putin as crossing a red line. In June 2024, Putin was at it again, threatening and refusing to rule out the use of nuclear weapons if there were ever any threats made against Russia's sovereignty or territory. We have a nuclear doctrine, he said. Look what it says. If someone's actions threaten our sovereignty and territorial integrity, we consider it possible for us to use all means at our disposal. This should not be taken lightly, superficially. Just two months later, Ukraine was inside Kursk. Putin hasn't followed through on the nuclear threat he implied with these statements. Granted, he has launched larger attacks against Ukraine, seemingly targeting the country's civilian areas. September 3, 2024 saw a Russian missile strike the Ukrainian city of Poltava, killing at least 51 people and injuring hundreds more in what The Guardian described as one of the deadliest attacks of the war. But the strange thing is that as devastating as this attack was, it could be considered something of a victory for Ukraine. It pushed back against a red line that Putin had linked to nuclear war and Russia's leader has only responded with missile and drone strikes. Significant and tragic as these strikes may be, they're a long way from the nuclear threats Putin presented in June. That's been a pattern throughout the war. A red line is drawn and then, after much cajoling and hesitation, Ukraine eventually crosses it. Russia's response has always been muted, with the threats of nuclear weapons never being followed through. It seems like Ukraine is trying to test just how far it can go. Which raises another question, why is Ukraine so intent on pushing these red lines? It certainly doesn't want to. In an ideal world, Putin would never have launched his special military operation, and Ukraine wouldn't have been forced into a devastating war that resulted in between 124,500 and 131,000 casualties for the Ukrainian military. Even more concerning for Ukraine is that Putin has clearly been targeting civilians during his strikes. Statista, reporting on data verified by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, or OHCHR, says that Russian attacks have killed 11,520 Ukrainian civilians, while injuring 23,640 more. Sadly, these deaths aren't limited to adults. 633 of the civilians killed were children. Those OHCHR stats reveal one of the key reasons why Ukraine is pushing back at Russia's red lines to such an extent. It feels like it has to. After all, Ukraine is the country that's losing thousands of its people. Many of its more important cities are being reduced to cinders and turned into minefields while it tries to overcome political logjams elsewhere. To Ukraine, every delay in providing military aid or permission to use the weapons it receives, however it sees fit, allows Putin to take more territory and kill more Ukrainians. Crossing the red lines isn't just throwing up a thumb in Russia's face, though that certainly is part of what it's doing. It's also the only way Ukraine is able to achieve a victory in this war, because not crossing those red lines would allow Russia to gradually steamroll over the country as Putin throws man after man at his special military operation. Ukraine is crossing red lines because it's been pushed to do so. But there's another reason. Ukraine needs to withstand Russian aggression to stop Putin turning his attention to the rest of Europe. That's the opinion shared by Peter Zelmayev, executive director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. During a September 2024 interview with Al Jazeera, NATO continues to send signals that it simply cannot afford to let Ukraine fail, he says. One of those signals, as we saw earlier, is NATO apparently establishing red lines of its own. But NATO's determination not to let Ukraine fall also highlights how the Ukraine war has evolved since February 2022. What was initially seen as an isolated invasion against a single country has broadened in scope enormously as the rest of Europe wakes up to the threat posed by Putin. NATO has specifically mentioned the likes of the Baltic states and Moldova in its own red lines because it's woken up to Putin's expansionism. For Putin, Ukraine would likely just be the beginning of a campaign that would expand to other nations that formerly fell under the Soviet yoke. For Ukraine not to fall, the country's leaders would argue it needs to be able to do more against Russia. The golden handcuffs need to be removed and more red lines have to be crossed for Ukraine to successfully defend itself. 
According to Zamayev, that is precisely why Ukraine is now calling for the US and its other allies to allow it to start using long-range missiles against Russia. Ukraine has identified, jointly with its Western allies, as many as 250 potential crucial sites inside Russia's territory, the neutralization or destruction of which, while not putting an end to the war, will significantly hamper Russia's continuing designs to destroy Ukraine. In other words, Ukraine has to keep pushing red lines if it's to survive, with NATO needing Ukraine to survive so that Putin can't turn his attention elsewhere. There's also a more practical reason for this pushing of red lines that was made abundantly clear by the Kursk invasion and lies at the heart of Ukraine's constant requests to use Western weapons and long-range missiles in Russia. Ukraine wants to give Russia a taste of its own medicine. Almost all of Putin's special military operation has taken place in Ukraine so far which has allowed Russia's president to curry favor among his people because they simply aren't being directly affected by the war. This was true as recently as November 2023, with the Atlantic Council reporting that 73% of Russians offered at least nominal support for the Ukraine invasion. But now the war is inside Russia. In Kursk alone, dozens of villages are under the control of Ukrainian troops. States of emergency have been declared in several Russian regions, with Kursk alone seeing 200,000 of its citizens evacuated as the Ukrainians stormed in. This isn't how the war was supposed to go from the Russian perspective. Putin was supposed to be able to storm in, take Ukraine quickly, and stand victorious. Even as the war evolved into one of attrition, Russia should still have been able to come out on top while facing no threat to itself. But Ukraine crossed a red line and went straight into Russia, demonstrating to the people in Kursk just how devastating an invading nation bringing war to your country can be. Ukraine didn't want to do this. It didn't want war at all, but by pushing the red line so far back that it's actually inside Russia, it hopes to chip away at Putin's support and destroy his image as the strongman of Russian politics. After all, how strong can Putin really be if he's allowed another country, one that's much smaller and supposedly has far less military might, to invade Russia? That's a question Ukraine wants the Russian people to be asking about their president. Pushing red lines back, thereby showcasing that Putin offers no response when they're crossed, is an excellent way to sow the seeds of doubt in the Russian population about their president. All of which leads us to another question. We've seen that Ukraine has been able to cross red line after red line, with none of the responses Putin has threatened coming to pass. Just how far could Ukraine push before Putin follows through on his threats of war against NATO countries or using nuclear weapons in Ukraine? It's likely Ukraine could push even further than it already has. Nichols points out that none of Putin's threats relating to his red lines have turned out to be true. As he puts it, if Ukraine's advance into Russia has shown anything, it's that policy positions around the conduct of this war and fears of escalation hitherto thought immovable and ruinously consequential may not quite be as fixed as they once appeared. In other words, the red lines have been repeatedly swept away with no real response from Russia, which suggests that Putin's constant threats of escalation have been revealed for what they really are – bluffs. Bluffing is hardly a new tactic for Russia. Rewind to the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s, when Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev attempted to use the threat of nuclear war to force America's hand in several ways. He wanted the US to pull its Jupiter missiles out of Turkey, as well as to halt a planned invasion of Cuba, or else he would doom the world to thermonuclear war. Khrushchev achieved his objective, in a sense, as the US didn't take Cuba and it did remove the Jupiter missiles, though it had already been planning to do so. But Khrushchev also lost the ability to station any of his own nukes in Cuba and, as Military History Online points out, Russia had to back down in the crisis because it couldn't deliver the same strength of firepower available to the US. It says that the Soviet Union had 45 missiles at its disposal that could hit the US from Cuba compared to 432 available to the US, a massive shortfall that would have led to a definitive Russian loss. Kennedy calling Khrushchev's bluff throughout the conflict led to the Soviet Union losing the image of having a technological advantage over the West, resulting in the Soviet Premier voluntarily stepping down just two years after the crisis. Returning to the present day, we see Putin adopting the same approach regarding Russia's red lines. Nuclear threats abound, but so many of them have already been exposed as bluffs by Ukraine. Its liberation of Kherson, which Putin declared as forever Russian, was supposed to be followed up by tactical nuclear strikes. It wasn't. Ukraine's constant attacks on Crimea and destruction of around a third of Russia's Black Sea fleet were supposed to provoke a nuclear reaction as Putin attempted to establish Crimea as a red line. It didn't. And with Ukraine now inside Russia, it's becoming increasingly clear to the international community that Putin doesn't follow through on his nuclear threats. Putin's bluffing has failed so spectacularly that there are now members of NATO who believe that the latest red line, allowing Ukraine to use Western long-range missiles against Russia, is another bluff. 
In September 2024, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg revealed that he doesn't believe Putin would escalate if Ukraine received the go-ahead to use those missiles. There have been many red lines declared by Putin before, and he's not escalated, meaning also involving NATO allies directly in the conflict, Stoltenberg said. He's not done so because he realizes that NATO is the strongest military alliance in the world. The NATO Secretary General also claimed that Putin understands that Russia cannot win a nuclear war, with NATO having made that very clear to him several times. The message here is clear. Russia's faltering invasion of Ukraine, in which it's lost around 640,000 soldiers, according to Ukraine's Ministry of Finance, has shown NATO that Russia isn't as strong as it claimed to be. The same goes for Putin's nuclear threats. None of them have been followed up so far. This suggests to NATO and Ukraine that the red lines could be pushed even further without a marked escalation of the conflict. As if to confirm this, reports are now circulating that the UK has secretly approved the use of its Storm Shadow long-range missiles inside Russia, which would represent another red line crossed. According to Euromaidan Press, the US may not be far behind in giving approval for similar use by its own long-range systems, albeit in secret, which would suggest that the West is becoming less and less wary of Putin's red lines. Putin has miscalculated. That's made clear in a September 2024 piece published by the UK Defence Journal, in which it points out that Russia's leader's red lines seem to shift more frequently than a London fog and with just as little clarity. Like so many others, it points out that Russia's red line threats have so far all turned out to be bluffs, with Putin seemingly attempting to use his nuclear threats to slow down Western support of Ukraine and force the West into a debate about whether to call Russia's hand. The journal concludes that Russia's red lines are as firm as jelly, with Ukraine in the West increasingly seeing Putin's threats as mere rhetoric, rather than reliable indicators of the actual responses that will take place if Ukraine keeps pushing. There's always a risk of Putin acting unpredictably, the journal concludes, but it believes that Putin doing little more than to huff and puff about nuclear threats is the far more likely scenario. That appears to increasingly be the approach that the West is taking with Russia meaning the answer to the question of how far Ukraine can push Russia's red lines seems to be as far as they want. Putin hasn't followed through on any of his threats so far and seems unlikely that he ever will. Make no mistake, this represents a massive shift in how the Ukraine war is being viewed on the geopolitical stage. That's highlighted by the Atlantic Council, which says that it's high time that the West, and NATO in particular, starts making Putin think seriously about his own red lines. It points out that NATO has given precious little indication of what it would consider a scenario grave enough in Western capitals to warrant an escalation in support for Ukraine, which has left Putin free to make his threats without fear of a response. This reactive response by the West throughout the war has placed the initiative of escalation in Putin's hands, the Atlantic Council says. This has allowed Russia to set the terms of engagement for the war. That's why the entire conflict took place in Ukraine alone until August 2024. Putin had control because of his red line threats, while in response the West had imposed just two red lines of its own. One of those came in 2022, when the US warned of catastrophic consequences if Russia chose to use nukes in Ukraine. The second came from French President Emmanuel Macron, who framed the idea of sending soldiers into Ukraine around the port of Odessa, suggesting the West would bring soldiers into Ukraine if Russia took that port. More recently, and as mentioned earlier in the video, NATO has created additional red lines related to Belarus. The Atlantic Council argues that the West should take things further. The setting of geographical red lines that protect Ukraine's southern coastline would be a good start, as would other red lines relating to attacking Ukrainian citizens and similar major war crimes. At the beginning of the war, such conversations would have been seen as needless provocations of a powerful military state. But now, with Russia mired down in a war while losing hundreds of thousands of men, turning Putin's strategy against him could be what's needed to finally force Russia's leader to back down. But perhaps those Western red lines won't even be needed. On September 19, 2024, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky claimed that Ukraine already has a victory plan in place. While he hasn't given any details of the plan's content yet, he claims that it's fully prepared and covers all the key focus areas needed to end the war. The plan doesn't involve freezing the war or providing the means for Russia to postpone its aggression. Instead, it will allow Ukraine to win, with Zelensky claiming that the most important thing is the determination to implement it. Could that plan involve crossing even more Russian red lines? Perhaps the more accurate question is what red lines remain to be crossed. Ukraine seems to have permission to use long-range missiles against Russian targets and it's already in Putin's territory. Perhaps this victory plan is the final demonstration that Ukraine is willing to push so far past the red lines that they may as well not exist. 
So confident is it now that Putin isn't going to follow through on the many nuclear threats he's made during his special military operation. Make no mistake about it, the threat of escalation still exists. NATO's red lines relating to the Baltic states and Poland demonstrate that any Russian attack on those nations would trigger Article 5 and drag every NATO member nation into the conflict. It also can't be overlooked that for all Russia's nuclear bluster and bluffing, it still has 1,549 strategic nuclear warheads, with a further 4,380 in its military stockpile, according to the Arms Control Association. Russia is still a dangerous threat to its enemies. The critical question now is a simple one. Does a red line exist that will cause Putin to stop bluffing and follow through on his threats to use these weapons? That remains to be seen. But what do you think about Ukraine's constant pushing of Russia's red lines? Is it the key to victory for a nation that's demonstrated time and time again that Russia isn't as strong as Putin claims it to be? Or will crossing Russia's latest red line by using long-range missiles against military installations deep inside Russian territory prove to be one push too many? Share your thoughts in the comments and thank you for watching the video.